Thank you so much for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, new video shows how Israeli hostages are being treated as a terrified mother is taken captive on October 7th with her young children, four years old and nine months old. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says it shows Israel is dealing with brutal kidnappers of babies. As Israel fights its war on terror, we're going to bring you a look at a key group of supporters of the Jewish state, the Christian Allies Caucus in the Israeli Knesset. It's one of the best ways you can improve your life, getting married. We're going to look at the positive benefits marriage can bring and why it's important for the health of our nation as well. And Lakewood Megachurch Pastor Joel Osteen telling his congregation fear is not going to win a week after a shooter opened fire inside their church. All these stories and more are ahead today, right here on CBN Newswatch. This is CBN Newswatch. We begin this half hour in Israel where the government released video of the youngest hostage and his family Monday, saying they are concerned for their well being and calling on the world to demand their release. All of this while the International Court of Justice is moving ahead with proceedings against Israelis' right to live in the biblical heartland. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl brings us the story. She's in Jerusalem. The Israel Defense Forces say they found the video in Khan Yunis. The IDF says it shows Shiri Bibas and her two children, four-year-old Ariel and nine-month-old Kfir, taken captive on October 7th, terrorists wrapping them in a sheet and forcing them into a car. Those who have the audacity to question our need to, approach, to operate in Gaza, but don't have the decency, the basic decency and humanity to demand that Hamas release our hostages first of all. They all should take a good look at this terrified mother, Shiri, clutching her babies. Kfir has since turned one year old while in captivity. Meanwhile, in The Hague, the International Court of Justice is hearing arguments over Israel's so-called occupation of Palestinian-claimed territory. Lawyer for the Palestinians Paul Riker says it's all about a Palestinian state. The best and possibly the last hope for the two-state solution that is so vital to the needs of both peoples is for the court to declare illegal the main obstacle to that solution, the ongoing Israeli occupation of Palestine. Attorney Andrew Tucker represents Fiji, one of the few nations speaking out for Israel. Palestinians uh, argue that Israel is illegitimate and that uh, the Palestinians are the true indigenous people of Palestine and they must have, uh, at the very least, a state in all of the so-called occupied territories. That includes the old city of Jerusalem, uh, the whole of the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, the Gaza Strip. He says the hearing is an illegitimate process intended to undermine the sovereignty of a U.N. member state. Fiji is basically arguing the court has no business in this conflict. This is a conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. Tucker says in a worst-case scenario, the court declares Israel an illegal occupier. The very existence of Israel and the territories, militarily, uh, administratively, but also the settlements are all illegal. Therefore, Israel should withdraw all of that out of the territories. And that will be used um, in all kinds of political processes to boycott Israel, to isolate Israel. Meanwhile, in the UN Security Council, the U.S. vetoed a resolution for a ceasefire, but is circulating another proposal calling for a temporary ceasefire linked to the release of all hostages and humanitarian aid to Gaza. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. As Israel deals with one of the most important battles in its history, it does have an ally that it can count on. Twenty years ago, Knesset member Yuri Stern began a one-of-a-kind caucus within Israel's parliament. As Chris Mitchell shows us, what began as a small group bridging the gap between Christians and Jews has grown into a global movement. Josh Reinstein directs the Knesset Christian Allies Caucus, now commemorating its 20th anniversary. It brings Knesset members and Christian leaders together 
to support the Jewish state. It's a commemoration of probably the most significant political development in Israel in the last 20 years, and that is the creation of faith-based diplomacy, when people take their biblical support and turn into real political action. And that started in this building 20 years ago today. And to have people come from all over the world during wartime to commemorate that and talk about how we can use that to advance the cause of Israel is really a blessing. For the first time in Jewish history, the Jewish people are not alone. We have our Christian allies, and they're standing with us like never before. Co-chair Sharon Heskel says while Israel is fighting a war for its survival, the anniversary is a reminder of the importance of Israel's friends. But during these difficult time of emergency, we see how the whole world is turning against us, how they are spreading lies and propaganda, how they support a murderous, radical Islamist terrorist organization. And many people are scared to support Israel. And this event today of 20 years of the bonds and the friendship between the Jewish and the Christian community is so important because there were so many people coming here, saying out loud, we're with you, we're your friend, we're still a bridge, and we will make sure that never again means never again. 20 years ago, many Knesset members shied away from working with Christians. I can tell you I was a member of Knesset then, uh, that the idea was not very popular in the beginning. We can say with a lot of content that after 20 years, we nearly don't hear these voices anymore because you've proven in the best possible way what true friendship is, what true support is, what mutual love for the Bible is, what mutual goals mean, and the goals are mutual. Knesset member Ohad Tal says Christians and Jews are locked in a battle for Western civilization. We have to win not just for Israel, we have to win for the entire Western civilization, for the entire free world, because if God forbid, we will not win this war. It will not end here. Radical Islam all over the world will feel that they have prevailed, and we can already see what is happening in the capitals of Europe, in America, and so many other places. So together, Be'ezrat Hashem, we will win. It's important to be here uh, at the 20th anniversary of the Knesset Christian Allies Caucus uh, because it's important to turn biblical support for Israel or support Christian support for Israel into action. And that's what the members of this caucus do all the time. It's important for members of Knesset to understand the importance of Christians all over the world uh, supporting Israel. And so that coming together in the great work of the Knesset Christian Allies Caucus is uh, it's historic. Um, and I pray that it only strengthens. Reinstein says the caucus has grown dramatically and spawned caucuses around the world. So we have 53 Israel allies caucuses now, just like we have in the Knesset, 1,500 legislators in our network. There would not be an embassy in Jerusalem if it wasn't for faith-based diplomacy. There would not be anti-Semitism and anti-BDS legislation around the world. We wouldn't even have observer status at African Union if it wasn't for our Christian supporters who've gotten involved in the political process. Faith-based diplomacy today, after 20 years, is the most important diplomatic weapon we have in our, our diplomatic arsenals. Reinstein says the caucus hopes to double the number of members in the next 20 years. As these caucuses grow, the influence of its members grow as well, and we see that all over the world. Uh, our network is becoming incredibly powerful and are speaking in ways and acting for Israel like never before, and I think the best of faith-based diplomacy is yet to come. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the Knesset, Jerusalem. Coming up is one of the best ways to improve your life, getting married. We're going to take a look at how marriage is good for you and why it's important for the country as well. We've got the story for you when we come back. Stay with us. Get your daily quick start from CBN News. A quick read on the important news of the day delivered right to your inbox. Stay current on breaking news, politics, and entertainment. Go to quickstart.news and subscribe today. Nothing predicts happiness in life better than a good marriage, not even a hefty bank account or a great career. Despite that, fewer and fewer Americans are getting married. Sociologist Brad Wilcox says it's a dangerous trend that puts our very civilization at risk. Wendy Griffith brings us the story. 
As director of the National Marriage Project, UVA sociologist Brad Wilcox wants you to be happy, prosperous, and, oh, by the way, save the planet. Dr. Wilcox believes the best way to do this is through marriage. In his new book, Get Married, Why Americans Must Defy the Elites, Forge Strong Families, and Save Civilization, Wilcox explains that many problems have their roots in the anti-family message and policies coming out of Washington, Hollywood, and the media, which is basically stay single without kids and make lots of money. I think what's striking about both the online right and the mainstream left is they're often telling us that sort of the path to prosperity and the path to happiness runs away from marriage and family. And yet the facts tell us exactly the opposite. The path to prosperity runs towards marriage and the path towards happiness runs towards marriage as well. You argue that strong marriages can actually help save civilization. Right. How so? Well, you know, we actually were sitting here in the shadow of Thomas Jefferson's university and his home just over there on the hill Monticello. And he, of course, was the author of the Declaration of Independence and mentioned in that declaration kind of the importance of the pursuit of happiness as kind of one dimension of the American experience, the American civilization. So what we're seeing now today, unfortunately, is that happiness in America is falling. Wilcox believes the main reason behind that decline is due to fewer Americans tying the knot. What's happened to marriage in the last really 50 years is that marriage has remained pretty strong among upper middle class Americans, Americans who have that college degree, Americans who are more affluent in one way or another. But for Americans who are in that more working class bracket, um, who don't have that college degree, who have an income between about twenty and $50,000, have really seen their marital fortunes decline a lot in, in recent decades. He blames two specific factors. Working class men are less likely to have full-time employment, making them less desirable as marriage partners. And some government programs like Medicaid may pay more if you have kids and don't get married. So there's a connection then between the way in which our public policies unintentionally end up penalizing marriage for working class couples. For those who do choose marriage, Wilcox finds nothing but good news. Married men earn more than their single peers, even compared to those with similar backgrounds. Both men and women who get and stay married accumulate greater wealth. Married men and women with families are less lonely, less prone to suicide, and report more meaningful lives overall compared to their single and childless peers. And husbands and wives who adopt a we-before-me approach to marriage, such as sharing a joint checking account, are happier and less divorce prone compared to those who take a me first approach. Then there is one group happiest of all, married couples who attend religious services. People who are married and who are church going are the happiest Americans. And that's because both, again, on average, you know, both folks who enjoy the benefit of a spouse and, and folks who enjoy the benefit of being part of a, a congregational community, a church community, are more likely to be embedded in intense social relationships that give their lives a sense of meaning, direction, purpose, and solidarity. And that translates into more happiness. And while it's true Christian couples divorce, Wilcox says stats show that couples who truly practice their faith are more likely to stay together, as opposed to those who just identify as Christian. People who attend church more often are between 30 and 50 percent less likely to get divorced. So it doesn't divorce proof your marriage, but it certainly reduces your risk of divorce to be. And this is church going. Not only are they less likely to get divorced, Wilcox maintains married Christian couples report the most satisfying sex lives of all married couples. They also have more sex than their fellow Americans who are not religious, mm. and they are more likely to be sexually satisfied than their fellow Americans who are not religious. Why is marriage our most important institution? I think because we're social animals, as Aristotle said, and really nothing matters for us more than the quality of our relations with friends and even more so with family. So it's kind of the core institution for basically guiding and directing this you know, most central institution in our lives. Wendy Griffith, CBN News, Charlottesville, Virginia. Still ahead, how what you eat can affect how you feel. We're going to hear about the relationship between food and your mental and emotional health right after this.
Americans are dealing with mental and emotional health issues like depression and anxiety in record numbers. And experts say what we eat can greatly affect the way we think and the way we feel. On this week's episode of Healthy Living, CBN medical reporter Lori Johnson speaks with psychiatrist Georgia Ede, who's written a book called Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind. It's about how healthy eating, especially cutting back on sugar, can improve our mood and our cognition. And we think of type 2 diabetes as a, as a blood glucose problem, but it begins as an insulin problem. And we think of, of, blood, of, of type 2 diabetes and blood sugar regulation problems as a problem with the body. But really, if you have a blood glucose problem and a blood insulin problem, you also have a brain glucose and brain insulin problem. Because... If you have insulin resistance, which now the majority of us do, more than 50% of adults in, in the United States have insulin resistance or prediabetes, then, uh, then uh, what happens then is that is, is your brain is slowly losing its ability to use glucose for energy. So uh, this, is, this is a very, very serious problem because you'll still be able to get glucose into your brain, no questions asked, but it's going to be insulin that has a harder and harder time. As your brain becomes more and more insulin resistant, the insulin itself can't cross into the brain as easily. So you can have a brain that's swimming in a sea of glucose and still be slowly starving to death. And that is what silently paves the long, slow road to most cases of, of Alzheimer's disease, which mm -hmm. is now called type 3 diabetes. Type 3 diabetes, yes. I've interviewed a number of Alzheimer's experts who use that phrase type 3 diabetes, which talks about insulin resistance. And as we, so many of us know, what causes insulin resistance, which is so damaging to our brains, is eating too many sugars and also foods that transform into sugars, which are these processed carbohydrates, things like white bread and tortillas, the list goes on and on and on. So a lot of carbohydrates and sugars. So obviously one of the cornerstones of eating right for your brain is reducing these types of foods and you sort of promote a ketogenic diet uh, but it, it does vary from person to person though right it does and this is really important because you know a lot of people when they hear ketogenic diet they think well i could never do that and i and i and i'm not going to do that it's a non-starter you know so one of the reasons i wrote the book in the way that i did was to let people know that there are various degrees of insulin resistance and various degrees of dietary uh, various types of dietary strategies that you can use, uh, depending on what your goals are, what your metabolic health looks like right now, and, and what your dietary preferences are. So there's a place for everybody to grab onto in the book. Uh, but really, what you just said is so important. No matter what your dietary preferences are, and no matter whether you have good metabolic health and mental health right now, or whether you already are suffering with poor me mental health or poor metabolic health, no matter who you are, how old you are, removing the refined carbohydrates from the diet, the sugars, the flours, the syrups, the crystals, the powders, all of those refined carbohydrates, removing those uh, from the diet is the single most important change you can make to your diet to protect your metabolic health in the long term. And uh, so these are, these are just carbohydrates from fruits and vegetables that have had their fiber and their nutrients stripped away. And they're really naked carbohydrates that turn instantly into glucose in the bloodstream. And that gives you a really exaggerated, unnatural spike in your blood glucose levels. And then you're going to need a lot of insulin, a big spike of insulin to take care of that glucose and bring it back down to normal. The more of the, so the, when you're eating too many of the wrong carbohydrates too often, you're going to see this repeated uh, you know, roller coaster of glucose and insulin and, and all kinds of other hormones will follow suit. So when you're eating this way, you're really destabilizing yourself from within. And you can find out more about healthy living and eating for your brain on this week's episode of Healthy Living. It's today on the CBN News Channel at 2.30 and 6.30 Eastern Standard Time. You can also see it on the CBN News app or you can find it on YouTube. Coming up, one week after a shooter attacked Lakewood Megachurch in Houston, Pastor Joel Osteen tells his congregation fear is not going to win and offers prayers and words of comfort to his own congregation. We're going to hear what he had to say when we come back. Stay with us.
Download the CBN News app. One place for all of your news. Breaking news alerts. Watch CBN News Channel Live. CBN News, because truth matters. Get the CBN News app today. One week after a shooter opened fire inside Houston's Lakewood Church, Pastor Joel Osteen declared fear, fear is not going to win. The suspect, who officials said had a history of mental health issues, died when two off-duty officers returned fire. Her seven-year-old son, who came home, who came with her into the church, was shot and is in critical condition. Sunday, in the very first service since those horrific events, Pastor Joel Osteen prayed for the child and for the mother's family. Aren't you glad that we're all here today? The goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, and you know, we're just going to take this whole service just to thank God for what he's done. We lift up that little seven-year-old boy, Samuel, that was injured here, Lord, at, at no fault of his own. Lord, we know you can do what looks impossible. Even though medical reports don't look good, Lord, I know he's in your hands. Lord, I pray for all the family of the deceased and the troubled woman. Lord, we just pray. Lord, I... I pray for her family. Lord, I know she was troubled in her mind. And Lord, I know her family's hurting. <laughs> but Lord, we know you're in control. So I just pray for comfort that for that family and just comfort for all those that are here. He is the God of all comfort. Time now for your Tuesday Tweet the Bullets, a message of encouragement for your day and a word for you to post, tag, tweet, and share with those in your circles of influence. Don't waste today with worry about yesterday. Fix your focus on maximizing today. It sets you up for a better tomorrow. With that word, make this a terrific Tuesday. It will set you up for a wonderful rest of the week. That will do it for this edition of CBN News. Watch one remind you, you can always find more of our programs on the CBN News channel at any time as well as online at CBNNews.com. Let us know what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can email us, newswatch at CBN.com. And of course, you can always reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We certainly would love to hear from you. We'll join, hopefully you'll join us right back here, same time tomorrow. Goodbye and God bless.